just leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread and what have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, just leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, just leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Yes, I'm safe. Hopefully that was a blessing to you all. I'll run back over here, scurry, and open up all my notes so I'm not rambling too much. Doke. So this message that I figured out, I was sitting um, up at my desk. I have a big old desk in my room, and I was sitting up there last night, and uh, I was beginning to study it. And before I study, I always want to go to the Lord and make sure that He uh, He's okay with what. I'm about to say because it's supposed to be coming from him through me. Um, and so I went up and I thought that I had an idea of what, uh, what he wanted me to say. But it turns out I went up there, I started praying, um, and then I began to write. And it's kind of funny, I write down a lot of my sermons and a lot of what I'm going to say. But um, as I began to write, I didn't notice it until I was completely finished. And I set down my pen and I looked at what I had and it turns out the Lord completely changed what I was going to talk about, same, same like outer shell, but everything else was different. So um, I trust that there is someone here today that this can help. I know it's already begun to help me. Um, hopefully it does the same for you. Um, it kind of has a comical uh, title, but if I had to give it a title, I would call it um, It's Time to Be a Bug. Um, I have some friends here. Some of my best friends are absolutely terrified of bugs, and usually it's a thing you wouldn't associate wanting to be like one with, but... You know, um, so if you would, please turn to uh, Job chapter 4, Job chapter 4, um, and we're going to read in verse 19 to start. If you're having trouble finding it, it's right before uh, Psalms. As I begin to struggle to find it. There we go. Okie doke. And then... Um, just before we read that, I want to tell you a story. Um, seeing how it's, it's titled Be a Bug, it's a little funny story to open with. Um, I remember back when I was in, I believe it was kindergarten, maybe first grade. Um, I went to a Christian school for three or four years. Um, and I remember I'm, I'm somewhat competitive. And uh, there was this one kid that I tended to butt heads with a little bit. It wasn't really much of butting heads because he was taller and stronger and Tended to carry me around the gym a lot. That was his way of showing it. But I remember one day he was in the gym and he was telling all the, all the rest of the kids um, how, how, how cool it was that he ate a worm. And that he had ate a worm the day or two before and he had gone out and just dug it up and decided to eat it. And all the kids thought he was so cool. And me being my envious little self over there, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to do something. I want to be cool too. I want to be cool just like this guy. So what am I going to do? So I decided to go home um, later that day and just so happened, I found a stink bug. And I thought, you know what? What would be better and even more disgusting than eating a worm than eating a stink bug? And so, uh, sure enough, I ate a stink bug. And to my shock, when I went back the next day to school, uh, nobody really thought I was that cool. They, kinda, they, thought, I was, they thought I was kind of strange, a little weird. Um, and now that I'm older, I can absolutely see why. It's kind of disgusting. But, yeah, so we're going to uh, begin reading in Job. I actually had a whole bunch of things I wanted to study in um, find out some more about bugs because the pastor's been preaching in First John and one of the verses in there stuck out to me and I was like, you know what? I wonder. And so I went through and I began to uh, research how many bugs are listed in the Bible um, and a lot of their uses and meanings and stuff and I'm completely surprised that there is a lot. Um, and so I had a whole lot of condensing to do um, and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of this. But um, the first one we're going to look at is the moth. So if you're there in Job 4, we're going to start reading in verse 19. Um, and just to give a little backstory, this is uh, Eliphaz, the Temanite, and he's, he's speaking 
uh, to Job and to the rest of the fellows that are there. Um, but the verse is verse 19. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. Um, it's one of those things that the moth is seen as, um, as, as very weak, very frail, very, a very delicate um, bug. And in my mind, I, if I had to equate um, a moth to something, I would equate it to um, lace, like the cloth, lace. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that, but it's very easily torn. It's a very fragile um, cloth. And that's kind of how I equate the moth to. Now, I was looking at this from a practical standpoint of how these, how these bugs relate to us. Um, one of the things that I found is that this doesn't really relate to us, but I mean, it might for some, not in a good way though, um, that they corrupt and they cause corruption and decay, moths do. Um, they go around and they eat and they consume. Um, if you want to flip over real quick to uh, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and we'll begin reading in verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. Just so you guys know, hopefully your fingers are nice and warmed up because we're going to be turning around quite a bit. Here in Matthew 6, verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasure treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And so we see that the moth is not really seen as a, uh, a positive thing in, in scripture. And I don't know if you've ever seen moths, but they usually come out at night and they always seem to flock towards the light bulbs and towards the windows of your house. And they just kind of flutter around. And if you've ever been taken off guard by one, then you probably had a few choice words to say about them because they're very startling and I would call them a nuisance. They're very annoying the way that they flutter around. Um, maybe you're here today and you feel like the moth. Uh, maybe you feel like you're weak and like you're helpless. Maybe you're dealing with huge things in your life and it feels just like it's, it's too much. Um, maybe you feel powerless. I know personally that's something that I, I wouldn't say necessarily fear, but I greatly dislike the feeling of being helpless and being powerless and I feel that as a man, it's my job to be strong. Um, I believe that the scriptures show that many times is how God wants men to be. Um, but I, I oftentimes struggle when I see these things in my life and how things just aren't fitting together like I thought they would and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, maybe you're like that when and you're dealing with things in your life and you're just, it's, it's very frustrating, but also it's just you get this gross feeling in your gut because you feel weak and that's something I never like to feel um, but as I was doing, as I was reading through this, that one really, really hit me um, pretty hard. And I'm glad the Lord showed it to me um, because guess what? If that's you, you don't have to worry. And just like me, I don't have to worry either because my God is the strongest being in the entire universe. There's no situation he can't handle. There's no problem he can't fix. And there's no confusion he can't sort out. He still cares for the moths and uses them, even though they would be seen as annoying and, as they, and they seem like they would be um, weak and frail, like they have no use or they couldn't do much. It doesn't matter because he still uses them and he can still use us. He still cares for us and he still wants to use us. Um, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, I, don't, I remember another story when uh, years and years back, we used to live in Pennsylvania. The church we would go to was called Grace Baptist Church. Um, and I remember there was, there was quite a few characters there. Even though I was young, I would always remember things by particular little traits. Um, and so, like, there's different people. One guy would always give me mints, little breast saver mints. Another guy would give me those candied orange slices with sugar on them. And I love them. They're greeters. Um, there was also a couple ladies. But one of them really, really stuck out to me. Um, she would always insist that I give her a hug. I don't know what her name is. I just always think of her as the mothball lady. Because that's exactly what she smelled like. She was an older lady. Bless her heart. But... But she smelled like mothballs. I don't know if you ever smelled mothballs, but they're absolutely disgusting. Um, and that's just something that's always stuck with me. Don't, if, if you're here, don't use mothballs, please. Unless you're like sticking something up in your attic, then I can understand it. But it is not a wonderful smell. Um, but why do people use mothballs? It's to, to repel and stop the consumption of you know, their clothes. So <laughs> there's that. Let's look at another, um, I guess you could call them bugs. Let's look at something else that also tends to consume. Flip back over to Job 25. Job 25, we're going to read in verse 
Number six, we're going to start talking about the worm. Job 25, verse number six. <clears throat> How much less man that is a worm and the son of man which is a worm. The worm is seen in scripture and it's mentioned many times and, it, and it's portrayed as nothing, as, as something of no importance really, um, as something that's not, that doesn't have huge effects. Um, maybe that's you here today. You feel, you feel downtrodden. You feel like you're not much. You don't bring much to the table for God. I'm here to tell you, it, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> God still uses the worms. He still, he uses them for, for many, many different things. Um, we also see that they consume just like these other bugs, which I'll get to later. But they're seen as nothing disgusting, even repulsive. Um, I don't know if you've ever gone fishing or had a desire to. I know uh, Brother Jim sitting out in the foyer. He's a big fisher. Um, I've tried multiple times and failed multiple times. So it's not really my favorite pastime, but um, I know one of the main baits that we tend to use is worms. Um, and going in the backyard and digging up worms is very disgusting, very uh, repulsive. So much so that um, it's kind of like it's, it's a realized thing among the entire world. There was a show that used to uh, premiere on TV a while back, but I don't know if you ever heard of it, called Fear Factor. There's a fellow named Joe Rogan. He's absolutely crazy. And he'd offer people prize money um, if they would face their fears. Well, guess what one of their fears was and happened to be in just about every single episode of the show? Worms. And he would have all types of stuff doing with them because they're seen as disgusting. Um, he would have people swim in them, lay in them, eat them, all types of different things. It's absolutely disgusting. But that's just something that the worm is. It's seen as nothing, and it's also seen as disgusting. Um, maybe that's you. Maybe you feel like you're nothing or you're unimportant. Maybe you feel as if nobody cares. Well, God does. He cares no matter who you are. Um, do you think God seriously would would lay down his life for you lightly. I don't know of anything that exists that lays down its life for someone else or for something else lightly. Um, it's always a very, very serious thing, and that's, that's a testament to how, how much he cares for us. Um, he longs to hear from us. He longs to see us. He looks down on us constantly. He longs to just talk to us. He just wants to talk to us. He loves us. That's how much he loves us. So if you're here today and you, and you feel like that's you, um, I would strongly encourage you not to feel that way because the Lord cares. He loves you. You mean the world to him, and he still has a special purpose for you, even the worms. Um, he has used them. I'm going to give you a couple references. If you wanted to write them down, you could go look at and see some more things about the worm. Um, another reference that it's mentioned and seen as nothing is in Psalm 22.6. Um, but then also we see that in them in Isaiah 51.8 and Job 24.20. Doke. Now, let's move on to the next one. Flip over with me, if you would, to Joel 1. Joel 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 4. Joel 1, verse 4. Kind of a tricky one, but it's in with the smaller ones, right after Hosea. Joel 1. We'll begin reading in verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten... And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar hath eaten. Um, this next one we're going to talk about is actually three of them. It's the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm. This is one of the ones that I noticed going into. I looked at and I saw, and I was like, a canker worm and a palmer worm. What on earth is that? Because you never hear anybody talking about those in modern terms. You'd be like, hey, buddy, guess what? I was walking in the woods the other day, and guess what? I saw a canker worm. Wow, my, you never hear that. So that sparked my interest, and I was like, you know what? I want to I wanna find out more about them. And so I looked them up, and it turns out they're literally different species of the caterpillar. Um, and so they're a little bit different, or all in the same thing. Um, one of the things that I found with the caterpillar is that they eat and they devour things, just like many of the other bugs, but uh, they're seen as pests because of how much they destroy particularly crops and vegetables and things. Um, but one of the big things I found is you don't normally see them. When's the last time you saw a caterpillar? And I'm not talking about the woolly bears. You can see those pretty much everywhere. They're kind of annoying. But caterpillars, I can, the last time I saw one, I remember was a while ago, back when we used to go chestnut picking. Um, but that's one of those things that you, you never really see them. Maybe 
But even though you don't see them, they're always working. Um, so maybe you're someone who, who works for the Lord behind the scenes. Um, you do a lot. You're tired. You're weary. You're broken spirited or, or you're worn out. Maybe you feel like you're underappreciated or underthanked for the things that you do and for the time that you put in. Um, you feel like nobody notices, just like the caterpillar. Well, my God sees all. He notices when his children love on him by serving. It's one of the things that it brings him great joy, not just happiness, but joy. The, the feeling that you get down inside of you that doesn't last for just a few minutes. It lasts all day, days, weeks even. Um, that's what you bring to God through serving, and he notices all of those things. Even though other people might not see it, he's the only one who really matters. Um, it fills him with great joy. But there's also another thing. Uh, since we're in Joel, look over at uh, Joel 2.25. 2, verse number 25. And it says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, look at this next phrase, my great army, which I sent among you. So even though the caterpillar and the canker worm and the, and the palmer worm aren't really seen, they do their job and they do their job well, and they do it behind the scenes, and it shows that God notices, and he, he even gives them a term of affection, that they're, they're his great army. Even though they're unseen, they're his great army. So if you're one of those people who serves behind the scenes, he loves you, and you are seen to him as a part of his wonderful army. Um, Let's see. Let's look. Uh, flip over to Job 39. You're noticing a theme here. We're in Job a lot. But uh, Job 39, verse number 20. Job 39 at 20. We're going to talk about the grasshopper and the locust because they are in the same family. Job 39, verse 20. Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. Now, from this verse, we see that grasshoppers are afraid. And it's one of those things, we used to live um, at Sandy Valley. It's where we used to be a pastor's family for eight years. Um, and we used to live in the building in a tiny little missions apartment. Well, the parking lot of Sandy Valley was divided into two pieces. One, one half of it was asphalt and chip and seal, kind of a mix of both. Um, and then the other half was all gravel. And one thing about uh, grasshoppers is there's multiple different species of them, but one of the species love to hide in rocks. And so we had all this gravel over there. It was kind of funny because as, as younger kids, we'd run out there. If you just run in a straight line, you couldn't see anything. But as you run, all the little grasshoppers would begin to jump and fly, and they'd fly out the way, just like little waves, you know. There's a bunch of them all over the place. Um, and so that's one of those things that I've realized is that the grasshopper's a very fearful bug. It's easily killed and easily eaten, and it's actually eaten by a lot of things, mainly birds, but it's very fearful. It's always watching. It's always nervous, um, and that's just, that's just how they are. Um, grasshoppers and locusts both. They're fearful, frightened, scared, and nervous. Um, once again, they kill and devour. They are pests, um, and mainly they destroy a lot of things, and not just because they're hungry um, or for our own personal gain. They destroy things just to destroy them. Um, and they were used by God as a tool many, many times, both locusts and grasshoppers, in his word. Um, maybe you're like the grasshopper in that you're dealing with fear or, or unsurety. I know it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, fear is, and I, I'm working to not downplay it. Um, because in my life, it's something that the Lord has um, helped me to conquer. I, I still get afraid, um, but it's, it's one of those things that I constantly have to remind. Fear is a very real thing, and there's many different reasons for it, um, but I just want you guys to know that um, maybe, maybe, maybe you're here and you just you don't know, and the the fear of not knowing um, is what is one of the things that's affecting you, or maybe you're seemingly lost, um, and that scares you. you. Just you're just not sure what to do. Well, my God is the one in control, the one and only. He's completely in control of everything. Um, He's the one who sees all, and he's the one who knows all. Um, the one and only solid rock who will provide stability and rid you of your fear. Um, flip over with me to, I actually have a, a multiple different uh, passages, but for the sake of time, we're just going to flip over. Um, let's go to Psalm. Psalms 18. Psalms 18, and we'll go verse 2. 
Psalms 18, verse 2. We'll actually hit a couple because there's multiple here. Um, and while you're turning there, I'll tell you some of the other ones. There's, it's also mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 18 and Deuteronomy 32, 31. But here in Psalms, Psalms 18, verse 2, make sure myself is there. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and my horn of salvation and my high tower. Here we see. Now flip over to 18, verse number 31. Look down on 31. For who is God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? And then we'll look at uh, verse 46. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. That's actually a part of a song, uh, one of the scripture songs. Um, but here we see he, he, is, he is the solid rock. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a ginormous rock that's like huge, um, but I have. And me and Mace, my little brother, we, we've been out uh, working on a trail because I love mountain biking. And so we're clearing a path through the woods. Well, we live in Ohio, and so there's a lot of clay for dirt, and uh, there's a lot of rocks, and we have multiple creeks. There's some of these rocks that are just massive. And uh, turns out Mace knocked over a couple of them, which was a huge bummer because I wanted them where they were. But because of that, we had to move them. Um, and that's one of those things I was thinking about while I was, while I was looking at this and seeing these things, that even just a small little tiny tiny rock that's this big still weighs like 200 pounds and was barely movable by me and him it took us 30 minutes to move it you know two feet um and to realize that that god he's he's our solid rock and he's not that small he's completely unmovable there's no way that you could ever you could ever shake him and so the closer you get to him the less shakable you'll be um and the better he'll be able to help you with your fear um and your unsurety You'll feel more stable when you're around him. Okay, okay. Let's flip over to uh, Joshua 24. Joshua 24. We'll begin reading in verse 12. Mm-hmm. Joshua 24, verse 12. And it says, And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. Um, Here we see the hornet. The hornets are drivers or pushers even. They're used by God to motivate and to move people. Um, Maybe, maybe, yeah, very, very painful way. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe you're somebody who, maybe you're not struggling with these different things, but you're just, you're not quite sure what to do for God. You, you want to serve him, but you're not quite sure what to do. The, two, the next two um, bugs that we're going to look at, um, there are options here. Um, the hornets, they're drivers and pushers, right? So you can be like the hornet. You can drive out sin from all around you in your own life, and then um, in other people coming towards your life, you can make sure that you keep all the sin at bay with the Lord's help. Um, but then also you can motivate and encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ when you come here to church, um, you don't always have to be somebody who's, who's, who's taking in all the time. I know we need to take in to make sure that we can grow, but then also while doing that, we need to make sure that we are um, encouraging our brothers and sisters and helping them um, and keeping them accountable. Sometimes it might take a swift kick here and there, but, you know, we can all use it every once in a while. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, now let's, let's look over at Proverbs 30, verse 28. Proverbs 30. Verse 28. And technically, technically, Micaiah is not here, so he most likely won't get on to me unless he's looking online. Technically, this, this one's not actually a, a bug. It's an arachnid, but, you know, I still consider it a bug. It's not an insect, but I call it a bug. Um, and it's the spider. So Proverbs 30 and verse 28. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Um, maybe you're someone here who's, um, a little bit older. You can no longer do the things that you used to be able to do. Um, you can be like the spider. You can create beauty around you, just like they spin their web and they're very meticulous and they take their time. Um, you can create beauty around you and, and uh, brighten whatever environment that you're in. Um, spiders are also usually very calm. Um, but to me, I also see them as very fun. They know how to have fun in very creepy sort of ways, but, you know, they do. So even though they're calm, they're ha- they have fun, um, and they brighten the world around them. Even though you might find them very creepy, their, their work is very beautiful. Um, 
And so that's one of those things that you can do, even if you're not the same person you used to. Now, I want to leave you with a thought, or actually a couple thoughts. Um, so let's look at uh, 1 John 1. 1 John 1. If I'm not mistaken, this is where this whole thing started. Um, we're going to look at 1 John 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 5. Read down through verse 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say then that we fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Um, this is one of those things that I, I began thinking about light because I have another message that, that God had showed me regarding light. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity to preach it here. But um, this is one of those verses I saw and then I began to think about, um, and that's when the bugs started to come into mind. But here we see that uh, Jesus Christ is portrayed as the light. He's portrayed as many things but in the Bible, but um, this is one of those things. Um, also, flip over to John, the normal book of John, not First John, uh, chapter 8, John 8, and we're going to read in verse... 12. These are all some verses that, um, all some, not awesome, even though they are awesome, um, the verses that talk about how he is the light. Um, verse number 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light, the light of life. Um, and so one of the things I want you to see here is as bugs are attracted to the light, we should be attracted to the light, the Lord. When we get close to him, all the benefits that I've mentioned from before, from each and every one of those bugs, every single one of them, the key is being close to the Lord, being close to the light. Um, without being close to him, you're not going to see any of those things, all of those struggles. If you're not close enough to him um, to touch him or to hear him or to talk with him, then you're not going to be able to get those benefits. Um, so I have six different points that you could um, write down or just make a mental note of. Um, number one is always chase the light. Um, as you see bugs, I don't know if you've ever been outside late at night, but you have your flashlight, you'll be walking around or a lantern or something like that if you go camping. Um, and late at night when there's no other light sources around, they always flock to the main one. And no matter where you go, they're going to follow you. I've had bugs follow me for literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of feet running away and they still follow you because they're following that light. That's how we should be, um, just like the bugs. We should be just like that um, towards the Lord, no matter where he is. Maybe, maybe you're having, maybe you've had trouble in the past um, with, with a certain church or something like that, or your church gets closed down for some, some awful reason, or, or for some reason you can't make it to church that day. Um, don't let that stop you. Chase after it. Try to find a way to get near him. You, we have online services here if you're not able to make it here. Um, or, if you don't, or if you're deciding to switch churches, don't just say, oh, I'm going to switch churches and then sit at home because it's too far of a drive or because you just can't make it anymore. Um, find a church near you. Chase after him. Um, and always try to keep that hunger just like those bugs do. They're, you know, incessant. They never stop, right? That's how we should be for him. Number two, get as near as possible. Um, Back at Sandy Valley, me and the team boys would always, after church, we'd go outside into our parking lot. We didn't have a gymnasium or anything, so we'd go out in the parking lot, have one of those collapsible basketball hoops, and we'd play basketball. Um, well, out there, we always had those giant um, lamppost lights. Like Normally, they're like street lights. We had three of them in our parking lot, um, and every time those would come on, one of them was right above the, uh, the basketball hoop. All the bugs would flock to it, all of them. They'd be up there, and it's something that Bugs don't really have brains. They have instincts given to them by God, but it's very apparent they don't have brains because they keep bouncing off the light bulb, and we would just sit there, and you'd stop for a second. You'd be like, what is that noise? And you hear bing, 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 and you're like, what in the world? And you look up there, and there's all these bugs literally bouncing off the light bulb and getting electrocuted. And you're like, man, this is crazy. But just as they are, and, and some, some people would see it as you know senseless, that's how we should be. Um, we should be trying to get that close to the Lord, trying to literally bounce off of him, you know, run at him with all that you have and get as close as possible. Um, number three, draw attention to it. Just like we were down there playing basketball, um, they drew attention to it because there's such a, a large swarm of these bugs. It made us, the passerbys, 
just stop and be like, what is going on, right? That's how we should be to the outside world. We should be drawing attention to him everywhere we go um, as we chase him. Um, number four, bring other bugs with you. You never, never, never see one single bug bouncing off the light bulb. You always see like 50 or 70 or, in our case, hundreds of them just going at it, right? That's how we should be. We should be reproducing in the Lord. We should be going out and sharing the good news and getting some more people in here. Um, number five, love your fellow bugs even though they have incessant buzzing. So this is one where you, I know there's people where you, you walk to church and you're like, oh, I'm going to hide from them. I don't, don't want to talk to them, you know. Why? Because they're going to tell you, oh, man, you know, my week, it was just so bad. And you're like, I'm trying to be happy about Jesus. <laughs> you know, I'm not really trying to be like, oh, yeah, I, I, I talk about that a lot. And today's the day I don't want to talk about it on Sunday, you know. Um, but it's one of those things we gotta, we got to learn to love each other um, and be there for each other when, when, when we need things. Um, because many, many, many types of bugs are um, colony species, and so they all work together. Um, and one bug alone will die quickly, so it's always good to stick together, strengthen numbers. Uh, number six, be unwanted and disliked, but in the right sense. Be unwanted and disliked to the world and to evil. Just as we as humans don't really particularly care for bugs, unless you're weird. I know some kids who like collect them and have those little boxes. They're like, oh, I'm gonna get bugs, you know? Weird. Anyway, um, <laughs> unless you're like that, um, the same way that we don't like bugs um, should be the same way that the world sees us, um, and specifically the things that are evil in the world. We should, when the devil and, and his workers and things like that see us, they should be repulsed just as we are at bugs and, and see, oh, that's disgusting. That's how evil should look at us. Um, and if we're not, if, if we can go around places and go around people who are doing evil things and they act like it's okay and that you can just fit in, that's a problem. And we need to reanalyze ourselves and make sure that uh, we're going after him and representing him like we should be. Okie doke. So I'm going to end with this. The worm is seen as nothing. The grasshopper, fearful. Hornets, as annoying. Spiders, creepy. Moths, as feeble and weak. But every single one of these little bugs, um, although insignificant, they always are used by God, no matter what. In every single one of these instances, God uses, he uses these bugs to do many different things. So no matter what, what you be dealing with, what you might be dealing with or, or not dealing with, just wondering what to do, um, it doesn't matter. God can use you. He uses everybody in all shapes and sizes. He needs different tools for different things, um, different life experiences to relate to other people. Um, and it's our job to be willing to conform to him because he's the potter and, and we're the clay and we have to remember it's, it's okay if we get a little messed up because he's the master creator. So even if we get stepped on a little bit and a little squished, he can always fix us back up. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we should do. Um, and then the last thought that I'll leave you with is that these bugs, they're always dependable to the Lord. Every single time God goes to use a bug, you never see a bug making excuses. Oh, God, I can't, I can't. When he, when he called in the locusts and the grasshoppers to... to plague the Egyptians. You didn't see any of them being like, really, I, I can't, sorry, I can't fly that far. I can't, you know, be that annoying. I can't eat that much, okay? You know, you don't see any of that. Why? Because they're always dependable. They're there whenever the Lord needs them, um, and they're willing. So I would just say that um, we should be willing um, to be able to do whatever he wants and just be dependable. So just run back through these things. Always chase the light, Get as near as possible. Try to bounce off of it. Draw attention to it. Number three. Number four, bring other bugs with you. Number five, love your fellow bugs, even through their incessant buzzing. And number six, be unwanted and disliked to the evil. There you go. That's it. Pastor, turn it back over to you. Should I leave this mic here? Yep. Good. Thank you. Anyone else here through the preaching of First John thought about bugs? <laughs> Interesting what God brings to your mind, isn't it, through, through the preaching. I've, over the years, have uh, preached messages, and someone has told me, said, that really convicted me, this thought about, and it wasn't even in the message, but God works in our hearts and things. Um, thank you, brother. I didn't know. I asked him to, uh, uh, last week or Monday if he wanted to preach, and he said yes. And I appreciate him 
being a good bug, dependable to do that, and that's, that's a blessing. Um, wasn't sure. He said, 20 minutes can't go more than 20, and I think you did, so you did a good job. Let's look at one verse together tonight, then we'll continue on so we get a, a twofer. Go to, go to Luke 24, where we um, were at this morning. Give a little thought here on a, a couple of verses. So after Peter goes and sees the resurrection uh, or, or the empty tomb, as we talked about this morning, then the, the chapter goes on. Um, the ladies had went and told the disciples that, that the tomb was empty and that the angels had told them Jesus is risen. We're all with me, right? Remember? And, and this is what they had said. And they remembered the, the words, what Jesus had said. And they told the disciples and also the other ones that were there. It says in verse 9, all the rest. And then Peter goes and he's thinking about what's happening and we preached on that this morning. Now look at verse 13. So this same day, um, and behold, it says two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlong. So if you look at verse 17, 13, it says two of them. Well, who's of them? Uh, what's the context? Who's, who's he been talking about? He talked about the ladies who went to told the apostles, and Peter was there, and all, all the other, uh, and the rest of them. So he is one of them. It's referring to the close followers of Jesus Christ, right? Now, maybe you've heard someone say to you, "Oh, you're one of them. You're one of them." Well, praise the Lord to be one of them. Okay, that's a good thing to be one of them, a close follower of Jesus Christ. These, these two going to Emmaus were members of the best group in the world. They're one of them. Look over in the book of Hebrews and just see uh, about being one of them. And, I, you know, we are glad that we are of them. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Are you of them that believe to the saving of the soul? Yeah, thank God for it, and it's good to be of them. Look over at um, the next chapter, 11.6 of Hebrews. For without, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to him, to God, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So to believe, to, to please God, you got to come to God. You got to believe, like it says, you got to believe that he is. Well, that he is. That's a kind of an open statement, isn't it? What do you believe that he is? You believe that he is everything he said in the Bible. I'm believing that, and then God will reward them. So it's good to be part of them. Now, back in our text, here's these thems, these two thems that are together, the ones that are saved by the, the, the believing of, of the shed blood. And they, well, they're, 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 they're going to be saved, but they're close to Jesus Christ. Now, a typical conversation about thems should be about Jesus. And if you notice the, in, in the next verse, it says, they talked together of all these things which had happened. Well, what things had happened? What are they talking about? Well, the, the things that, that had happened. They're, they're talking about, you know, how Christ, you know, Jesus had been arrested and, and about his death on the cross. And, and now they're thinking, of, they're talking about what these women had told about how the, the tomb was empty and that Jesus was alive and the angels. And they're talking about these things. And now their understanding was wrong about what had happened, but I guess it would be a good thing for thems, when we're together with them, other thems, we should spend some time sometimes talking about Jesus. It's just something that Christians do. You talk about God, and they talked about a good subject, Jesus. So don't forget that spiritual conversation when you're with other thems that you want to talk about Jesus. The Bible says, consider how great things he's done for you, and God's been good to us. 
So while they're walking, they're talking about the amazing events of the week. And, and while they're walking then and talking about Jesus, these, these believers, these believers as they can be at that, at that point in of dispensational truth, it says, it came to pass in verse 15 that while they communed together, these guys talking about Jesus, and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with it. While they're talking, Jesus appears to them. See it? It's kind of neat. Of course, he is risen from the dead and he is alive. No, he appears to them. Now, practically speaking, it'll be easier for you to commune with Jesus and to hear from Jesus if your mind is already thinking about Jesus. These guys are already talking about Jesus. He's already on their mind. If you're gathered together in the name of Jesus like we are in church, it's, it's a lot easier for you to hear from God, right? Now, so it says Jesus himself drew near. Remember the verse in James that says if we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us, exactly. So maybe you are saying, well, you know, preacher, I just feel that God's so far away. Well, maybe it's because you're far away from him. Or, or maybe it's because you never talk about him or he's not, he's not in your mind. And, and thinking regularly about God and continually about his things will, will help your focus and will help you to be able to hear from him. Just, just a practical truth. And so they're talking about Jesus, and Jesus drew near, and then it says that he went with them. Well, that's the challenge. That's what we want. We want Jesus to not just stay here in church while we're gathered together, but we want him to go with us when we're out and about. Amen? And I won't preach the rest of this chapter. Maybe we'll look at it on, on, on Wednesday night and look at the rest of this thing, but just some thoughts there that... It's a blessing to be saved. And Sam Gibbs saying, he always says, uh, the, the worst day saved is better than the best day lost. And isn't that the truth? Good to be a Christian. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson about these, your creation. Lord, you told us that your creation teaches us about the creator. And God, we are thankful that you made these creatures. We don't understand all about insects and bugs and things, but we know that you used them and you have used them to do your purpose. And Lord, we help us to be, as, be more obedient than a bug. And Lord, it's a real challenging thought that they, they don't complain, they do what you ask them. And God, I pray that us who have souls and eternal life, God would want to be more obedient than these creatures. Lord, we sure appreciate your goodness to us. We appreciate the privilege of being a Christian. We appreciate the privilege, God, that if we draw near to you, you promised that you'd draw near to us. God, we need you. We need you, God. We sure do. And Lord, help us to get that want to in our hearts that we would want to be closer to God so that we could know what your way is and your will is and we could just experience it, God, through, through our closeness to you. Thank you for this service tonight, the folks that made it back on this Sunday night. Thank you for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the promise that we're going to be resurrected too. Amen. It's exciting to think about. Bless us as we continue on our ways this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing a, a hymn as we close. As You can pray. You can think about these thoughts. Get your hymn book out. 639. 639. O oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life, 
crushed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Well, we are going to go dining on Monday night. Sure want you to come out. If you're able, just meet us over um, before six o'clock over in the parking lot over at Walgreens. I'd like to get a good group out there. It's just impressive to see all them people standing up for Jesus. And if you're not ashamed of him or sitting up for Jesus, some sit on the stools and chairs, that's fine. We hold the gospel signs and that is a busy intersection. A lot of people see the gospel. So we'll do that Tuesday night at six o'clock. We'll start. So be there before. We'll pray, get our signs and that'll be on Tuesday night. All right. So hopefully some of you can come out. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Brother Rick Jarvis, would you give us a dismissal prayer asking God's help? Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for sending us up from the Word of God. Bless John. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord. All right, you're all dismissed. We'll see you next time.